thank you for coming and welcome to my guests who have joined us on Zoom as well. And thank you very much to Science for the invitation and also for supporting the project alongside Neem and my own University of Sheffield Hallam and Arts Council England. I can't tell you how nice it is to be in front of a live audience for the first time in many, many months. So yeah, I really appreciate this. Um, so to... Um, so to, <laughs> so to echo Cleantis, I work with uh, photography, video, installation and animation. I often collaborate with other artists and technologists um, and work with custom built software um, and devices um, and also use new technologies and te technique and work with other people to support me in those processes. Um, but I also use and reference analog technique. It's an important part of my practice. I'm interested in the physical and the digital, visible, but also invisible or less visible barriers that keep people alienated or impose power dynamics. But my research also crosses paths with borders and bordering, definition, visual hierarchies, technology, civil liberties and freedoms. It feels a real privilege to be able to travel relatively freely at the moment, especially when we're traveling from the UK where our COVID-19 rates are so high at the moment. I've canceled this uh, planned trip four times in the last year and a half. And borders, as we know, extend further than state borders or green lines. And perhaps COVID has extended globally the experience to some extent of restrictions to civil liberties and freedom of movement or our understanding of that. We've also witnessed across the world governments implementing authoritarian political agendas on the back of the global health pandemic. So I'll just go on to my next slide. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and alongside this in the UK, we're beginning to understand the implications of Brexit on free trade and freedom of movement within Europe. And here I am in Nicosia, the only divided city in Europe. But let's not forget the refugee crisis and the migrants and refugees who dig, go under, go around, climb or float over, or cut their way through the fences, walls and security technologies that mark the edges of our global borders. So today I'm going to present selected works and illustrate how arts practice develops, informs, and underpins research contexts and established methods. As an artist, my research is steered and critiqued by making artwork, but I'll talk through this process with a, a series of selected works from my portfolio. And then I'm gonna introduce new work that I'm commencing in Cyprus during this past, well, past 10 days in partnership with Neem. Um, but so to start with, I'm gonna show some really early uh, film and animation that I made 15 years ago. Oh, come on, slides. Okay. So this um, first bit of animation is called Eurostar through Brixton. It's just three seconds long, and it was made at a time when I was uh, beginning to work with moving image and moving away from a photographic practice. I was exploring this transition from analog to digital, from still to moving, and I was interested in the effect that this has on our notion of time and space. I'll just play it, so don't blink because you might miss it. And the Eurostar had just been developed and it ran past the bottom of my garden and it was really exciting to see it there. Um, so there's 72 uh, single frames shot on a Super 8 camera that I then scanned into a program called Director and reanimated them. So the sprocket hole you see on the right is what would be used by a traditional film projector. For me, uh, film traveled from left to right and I was using the train as a metaphor to represent film, the separate carriages being the separate frames of a film. Um, and I was also at that time reading a text by, or a book by Roger Manville written in the 1950s, who was talking about film as a, a new art form. And he described the mechanics of film and that film traditionally project, uh, travels through a projector beam at 24 frames a second. Um, and in order to present the blur of images, the Maltese cross will cover it for 48th of a second. Manville then proposed that half of all our time in the cinema is spent in the dark. 
And this really gripped me and has informed you know, years and years worth of work um, because I just could, I, I was really intrigued that we were not aware of this unperceivable black space. And I began to play with this idea through experimental film and nonlinear editing using Final Cut Pro and After Effects and also using motion tracking software. Uh, so the next film I'm going to show is called Platform. I've taken this opportunity to rescreen this in Cyprus. It was made in 2005, and at the time I was really excited to have it selected by name and shown in uh, Limassol. Um, so I just play Platform. shockingly bad the quality of standard definition now we're so used to seeing things in that really bright punctuated high definition so um i began to think of this this non-space this gap the void not as a, a free space in the way that we might think of an expanse but as a controlled space um, and in between space or a state of, of stasis or limbo of not being here or there in one space or another, thinking of it as a loss of coordinates, a space of no agency and a space of control. And I made a whole series of digital shorts, interactive installations uh, and photographs and multi-screen animations for about 10 years that explored and expanded these threads in the work. So there's this play between analog and digital, disorientation, frames and edges and detection, a viewer and viewed, of distanced or detached cameras. I made work with CCTV and delay units. And as time went on and technology developed, played with drones and data flows. And at that time, I didn't really think of my practice as being about surveillance for some reason. I just was playing with technology, but the technology is always or generally embedded in a militarized use. I became really interested in the, in the power dynamics that are embedded within these technologies. So now I'm going to jump to a piece of work I completed more recently in 2017 called Come and Go. Okay, so this piece of, this isn't my work, but this piece of work referenced very early analog films of the serpentine or butterfly dance um, shot by Edison and others in the 1890s or early 1900s. And this dance was often filmed because of the the kind of spectacle of the dance and the way that the material and the dress moved around the frame to create this kinetic movement. Um, so it was a really good subject for a static and silent camera. I wanted to rework this historical footage um, through contemporary technique and digital media. And I began to think what a contemporary rework of this dance might look like. I decided to film it on high-speed camera to generate slow motion footage. So it was really, high resolution, and that I would film it from above. Um, so I was referencing Hito Still's writing, where she talks about um, traditional perspective or our point of view as being switched from one that is on the ground and stable to be from above and in flight. And we might think of this in terms of Google Maps, um, of drone technology, um, 
a God's eye view, images of warfare, gaming technologies as well. Um, I spent about two years working up the, the kind of description and thinking around this project and trying to secure funding for it. And eventually created a brief for a choreographer called Alexander Whitley, who worked alongside uh, dancer Natalie Allen. And we, um, very in a very short time frame, developed these ideas of transition, limbo, flight, the loss of coordinates and disembodiment, a tanglement, a, a tangle, entrapment, or mechanical flight. And this was the brief for the dancer to work up just 20 second dance phrases with this eight meter length of silk. And we tested the weight and flows of the silk and how it moved within the frame. I then asked the dancer, Natalie Allen, to dance each dance phase. But after she danced it uh, in the normal way, uh, I, I call it forwards, we then asked her to dance it backwards to reverse the dance. So this meant that I could then create two natural loop, loop points between two different frames of playing it forwards and backwards. Um, and then I worked alongside creative technologist, Matthew Jarvis, who built the software. And we made an interactive work using a Kinect gaming camera um, that then detected the audience in the space. And depending where you were, would either ramp the footage into from slow motion, which it ticked over in, into real time, or it would begin to play backwards or it would move back into real time. So the camera would detect you and there were these dead zones where you could step out of the detection. And the audio was also, also affected by a layering of audio and um, a kind of audio artist, Amy Beeston and Mark Summers programmed that audio for me. It doesn't get shown much, this work doesn't because it gets it involves so much data processing to show it. Um, I'll just show you the, uh, the footage documentation. So this is of its uh, um, site gallery in my hometown, Sheffield. So you can see the backwards flow on the left hand screen at the moment. So 20 seconds worth of slow motion footage is about six minutes of, yeah, 20 seconds of slow motion filming at 500 frames a second is about six minutes of slow motion. And it's not entirely seamless, it disrupts the playback. It, sometimes stutters and sometimes gets, it feels really fast in real time. So now the right hand screen is playing backwards. Okay. 
So the when you entered the space, it created this play of move and counter move between the audience and the dancer. Um, I was thinking of um, Orwell's 1984, when Winston's writing about the spaces where he was able to avoid the telescreens and write in his diary. The work began to reference these, these thematics again of stasis, movement, bordering, detection, of drones, remoteness, resolution, seeing and looking, and the power relations implicit in these technologies. It was also made during the height of the refugee crisis and a period of impending political uncertainty in the UK as the EU referendum took place. And whilst developing this work, I was also completing work that I'd started in Berlin on a short residency in 2014. So this is the Berlin Wall Memorial site, and I've been making strip uh, uh, pieces of work along the death strip where it had gone wild or was still under development. And I was also filming in the Ber Berlin Wall Memorial site which is this preserved sealed section of the original wall, wall used for tourism and educational purposes. And there's an education center opposite the wall. Um, so again, I was drawn to this, this idea of the gap, this um, no man's land as being this gap between two film stills. Um, so that framed by these two opposing ideologies of the East and the West of communism and capitalism. Um, so when I use technology and devices, it's often a way to disrupt or enhance, alter or enable or act as a vehicle to see more or to witness. I made a film called Lines of Resistance. It's uh, just a digital short, about seven minutes, which, which took about five different trips to, to make. Um, but that's on my website, so I won't have time to play it. Um, I'll just click to that still. Um, so sorry, yeah, so this, the slide before, this is me filming with a custom built eight foot high tripod uh, with a remote control and a reference monitor. And at the time I was looking at filming over the wall into the memorial site, into this historical site, and then thinking about this reveal of the contemporary uh, kind of horror tourism site um, or historical site uh, as, as, it, as the camera moved out of that. But when I looked at the footage, I just made myself a benign CCTV camera. Okay, so alongside this film, I made two panoramas um, with a machine or kind of motorized tripod head called a Gigapan. Um, so you set with a Gigapan, you set the top left and the bottom right of the image. And this image is six, images wide by nine high to reference film. So it kind of literally just clunks through the image. It's really quite crude and presses the shutter for you um, line by line. And then the image is stitched together in accompanying software um, to process all the images. And then in post-production, the perspective was um, altered and corrected. Uh, so to take this photo, it took about 20 minutes to take each image and the uncompressed image size is about four meters by just under two meters wide. Um, so I was kind of in this space of the former death strip, drawn to this by the meandering path, the pictorial qualities, the vehicle left over on the left of the image as kind of possibly from the Cold War and this wall that cut through the center. And uh, I went up to the wall to try and get a look over it. It was just at the right height to make sure there was no way you were going to look over that wall. And you could, there was nothing around to mean that you could pull yourself up. You couldn't get any purchase on it. They definitely didn't want you to look over it. So I made myself these wooden, just a little wooden tripod from bits of wood I'd found on the floor and stood on that whilst I framed my shot to see up and over and to set up the panorama. And as I balanced there, a man came past and he told me that the building site on the right of the image would be the new German secret service building, now uh, the second largest security agency in the world after the CIA. Um, and, and Google, uh, sorry, Gigapan is part of technology developed by Google and NASA to take uh, remote pictures on Mars. 
forensics have since adapted use of this technology to use at crime scenes so that you can zoom into the detail to reveal more information. I think there's, you know, much better ways of doing that now. So for me then the image spans the old and new materials of state surveillance. On the left of the image is the decommissioned death strip taken over by the undergrowth since the revolution of 89. And on the right of the image, the building of the new German Federal Intelligence Agency, the recommissioning of state surveillance. In this panorama, both of these sites of surveillance are in a transitional state in flux. And within the image, there's this collision of time zones where things are in, in, in yeah, not quite formed or in transition. Surveillance then begins to take the place of the former border walls of the East and the West. There's different forms of surveillance on each side of the image. And in between is a wasteland disarray, a scar, a crime scene. The image presents the evidence of the fall and rise of state control, the use of surveillance to support state power, and through this speaks speaks of the rhythm of politics and, re and resistance. So this image then became really important to create a structure for my doctoral research, a historical reappraisal of state surveillance made possible by the Stasi Records Agency and the contemporary extension of new state surveillance capabilities in the UK through the passing of the Investigatory Powers Bill in the Houses of Parliament. Over time, as the UK was stuck in the middle of this state of limbo, whilst the EU withdrawal bill went through Parliament, I began to think of this wasteland, this in-between space, a gap, a state of limbo, as Brexit, which happened right in, my, in the middle of my observation of the investigatory powers bill as it passed through Parliament. So this brings me on to doctoral research. In the investigatory powers bill was new surveillance legislation that became law in 2016, that significantly extends the UK's uh, digital surveillance capabilities. So I watched the debate in Parliament uh, towards the end of the debate. Um, so I think it was the last eight months and I'd spend up to eight hours a day in either the House, uh, House of Lords or uh, the, God, I've forgotten the other name. The, the House of Commons, thank you, Yanis. Glad you're here. <laughs> um, and then what I decided to do when I, whilst I was there, was to take pictures on a Minox Cold War spy camera and to record audio on a 1980s dictaphone in some areas that it wasn't permitted, whilst Parliament de was debating what Edward Snowden described as the most far-reaching blanket surveillance legislation in any Western democracy. And at the Stasi Records Agency, I requested material from hidden cameras that had faults, had been sabotaged or missed the subject or reveals more about the agent behind the camera or the situation of the documentation itself. I was thinking how strange it was that this clumsy, almost comical technique and device was used to carry out one of the most effective, not well, to support one of the most effective and brutal surveillance regimes ever to have existed. I wanted to see the material that was generated by these devices that were on, now on show at the Stasi Museum, but I didn't want to revisit an invasion of privacy. So there's this reversal of the viewed and the viewer still continuing to be played with, of seeing and looking and being seen. The research addresses two key questions. Can a knowledge and understanding of the materials and techniques of surveillance expand our knowledge and understanding of the political frameworks that authorize its use? And how can arts practice make visible and an act of critical analysis into the repetition and repurposing of surveillance narratives? I supported this study with surveillance literature uh, I took with me into Parliament books by Solzhenitsyn, by Orwell, texts by Vaclav Havel, and also contemporary writers like Anna Fundo, who wrote Stasiland, and Ali Smith. And I carried these in with me as I watched the debate take place. Uh, so these are some of my images that were taken on the Minox camera. Some of them of the inside of my pocket. The most uh, best exposed ones of the parliamentary toilets where I was free to take pictures as I wished. Um, these pictures were taken on the first sitting of parliament after the EU referendum vote, 
Uh, it was the day that David Cameron resigned and it was the day that uh, protesters were outside the, the shot on the bottom second right of the um, far image on the right, which is protesters outside Parliament who were protesting in support of Jeremy Corbyn after 27 members of the shadow cabinet had just resigned, trying to um, get him out of power. Um, and these are images from the Stasi Records Agency uh, taken. This is just two from a series of about 12 of agents learning how to use a buttonhole camera. I think that the the people in the images are possibly other agents or friends. There was a lot of learning by doing uh, material in the Stasi archive as there was a lack of uh, manuals as cameras were often brought in from the West. Uh, so trial and error, and also pictures of uh, new um, surveillance techniques. And the anonymization filter, the digital filter is placed on the face by the Stasi records agency to make sure there's not a double invasion of privacy as these are released for research purposes. So the image, these images also contain this evidence of two time zones of the analog and digital. It's what researcher Susan Shupley from Forensic Architecture would refer to as the material witness, um, the historical evidence that's embedded within the images that we're looking at. And this is um, the, some of the work from the doctoral research installed at a gallery in Berlin called DECAD, uh, curated by Marika Spendel. So the images on the right are images of dissidents taken on a briefcase camera. These are also images that had been sabotaged and rescued by civilians um, when they stormed the, the building in 89. And these images um, are documenting Mikhail Gorbachev's visit, state visit in 1986 to, a, to the opening of a new residential estate. So, and in the, in the other room of the um, exhibition, there is a projection of um, a six screen surveillance operation. Uh, so the, I was given six files of the same uh, kind of undercover protest that was taking place in, on the 7th of every month in 1989 um, across the Eastern Bloc. This was in September. So just before the wall came down um, and the footage was always cut in camera. Um, there was very little editing that went on once the surveillance footage had been shot. So alongside um, uh, Kipros Kipriani, who's um, taking uh, partnership on the new project in Cyprus, we reversed edited all the footage. So anywhere there was a cut mark, we replaced with a black gap. So we, we reversed edited all the footage into real time. Um, and then we synchronized all six screens so that whenever there was something happening, um, I'll just move this zoom bar because you can't see the subtitle. So whenever something was happening, like um, a protester being arrested, all the cameras would suddenly come together and focus on, on the subject and then they would disperse again. So there was these moments where you got a panoptical view of the surveillance operation and moments when they were disparate again. And not all the screens are on all the time. They are spread over about two, I think it's a two hour, 40 minute loop. Um, or, yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else to say on that. Yeah, so because, the, um, because it was illegal to protest, protesters were, um, were, were kind of protesting undercover by amassing in Alexanderplatz. And so there was a lot of um, Stasi agents who were acting as agent provocateur. So they were dressed up as protesters, trying to infiltrate the protesters and um, then re uh, report them and arrest them. So within the footage, as you begin to look, and as we began to look and resynchronize it and match it, we began to notice who all the agents were within the, 
within the footage who were undercover, not all of them, but some really obvious ones. Um, and I gave this, um, gave this back to the Stasi Records Agency because they hadn't seen it in this, in this format before. Um, but because there isn't any footage of them showing their ID, then there is nothing that they have to anonymize anyone who's kind of center frame, um, even if they believe that they are Stasi agents. But really, um, if they show their ID, the, the Stasi records agency do not have to anonymize them. Okay. And then there was also two um, monitors which were showing these uh, footage of um, briefcase camera training. So agents, I'll just play it in the background actually. Agents training how to use um, briefcase cameras. So these are kind of, there's a, a figure in the, a kind of profile figure with a focus chart and um, calibration setting. Just come back a little way. Um, and a grayscale chart there. And these agents, as they pass the camera, were practicing different signals that were brought to life by um, a description in Anna Funder's book, Stasi Land. So they're describing the, the, the tick of the, of the everyday of the man in the street, of the sneeze, the tying of the shoelace, the hands behind the back. And these signals are practiced in the footage. And this, these are all agents just beginning to learn how to focus, pan, tilt, um, and just use the, use the camera. It's about 30 minutes long. How am I doing for time, by the way? It's Sorry, what was that, Yann? So... Okay, so I'll begin to run. Okay. Okay. Um, a bit more. I might see some signaling. So yeah, this is a blowing of no signal in the 70s. Okay, so I'll just um, go on to the, the project that we're about to begin here in Cyprus. All these are annoying, aren't they, these Zoom things? Okay. Um, so to, to start the project, I've invited uh, my partner, Jeremy Lee, to collaborate alongside UK uh, Cypriot artist, Kipos Kipriano from Newcastle University. Uh, when I was last here in Nicosia, I presented at the Unconference um, as part of the University of Nicosia Research Foundation. Um, and whilst I was there on the last day, I hired a car and drove through the Green Line into Northern Cyprus to the edge of the fences that surrounded Verosha. I came back through the checkpoint at Nicosia and used this short trip to begin to devise an outline project in partnership with Neem. And now on this trip, I've just been in the process of establishing what form this, this research might take. So this might seem a bit of a back to front approach, but rather than the imagery that we're generating acting as documentation to illustrate an approach or a particular history, for example, the documentation is part of developing the research area and the project. So the exchanges and conversations that I have are an important part of devising the work, as well as the sites we visit and the images we produce, the looking and the reading that we do. And I hope to be able to support the project with some interesting Cypriot literature, as well as critical text. So in this way that we learn we learn to understand more about the personal, historical or political narratives that surround the context that we're exploring. And as the work develops towards exhibition and presentation, the research evolves through these points of critical reflection. But we're also um, been contacting archives and we'll be carrying out some archival research. 
So um, I don't know whether any of you were at the Jeremy's LIDAR workshop earlier today. So these were my images taken in 2019 where you could only just go up to the edge of that fence and you weren't allowed to take photographs because the Turkish police would whistle at you. And so the, the point of view is again, uh, reflecting the situation of the documentation. That's my friend's arm there, as he was sunbathing. Okay, so I decided that for this project, as well as using film and photography, it'd be interesting to use LIDAR technology and photogrammetry to generate the imagery. Um, so the LIDAR scanner uses a laser to generate point clouds to create high resolution 3D mapping of an exterior or internal surface of objects, mainly for scientific or geographical or forensic use creates an image made up of point clouds where the edges fall away, creating maps of surfaces in their shell-like form. It seemed to me to be the right kind of technology to use to document inaccessible or empty spaces or objects that were temporary, transitory or in stasis, no longer inhabited or abandoned through military force. So this is an image, this isn't actually a LIDAR scan because we, we haven't had a chance to process those on this trip. And this is an image that we took during this trip at Varosha made with photogrammetry. So photogrammetry is si similar to LIDAR, but you're taking a series of images either alongside or circling an object. And then the algorithm creates a 3D space from those images but it has a, a similar aesthetic. So this is a kind of a slice of a light uh, photogrammetry again. Um, and this is at the edge of the buffer zone, uh, just on the edge of Par Paramalini. And the white sign in the distance is, uh, is a sign saying, this is the edge of the buffer zone. Um, so these are low res screen grabs Normally you can move around this 3D space and explore um, the area. So the technology makes a 3D map of the surface. Underneath this map is a hollow interior or vice versa, where the laser light hits the surface of the building wall or object. So today we made laser, laser scans inside the home for cooperation. So we'll have an interior documentation of that, but obviously we weren't able or allowed to document outside or create lasers, uh, LIDAR scans in the buffer zone. So again, the technology begins to reflect the situation of the documentation. And many areas surrounding the green line might appear broken down, ruined and lacking definition. But I was thinking that actually this is in fact a space that is overdefined, and as many sites of stasis or suspended animation. There's also a huge amount of UK and American mil military infrastructure uh, within Cyprus. So we've been explore, exploring the areas and zones that are accessible or inaccessible, passable or restricted, um, like the British base in Limassol, areas adjacent to the buffer zone, the resort of Varosha, but also organisations or businesses that exist within the buffer, bus, buffer zone, um, or organisations that generate a bicommunal conversation. We're interested in the uh, the trade, the services, the movements and protests, the customs and heritage, the flora and fauna that straddle and transcend or blur these zones or blur the definition through commonality or transition. Um, so oh, I haven't put my favourite slide on. So this is a pair of abandoned shoes just near the British military base. And that's everything. Thank you, Rose. Thank you very much. <laughs>